Welcome back to the Medical Chalk Talks, episode number two. I'll be your host, Evan Arias, and for this episode, we're going to try to make mechanical ventilation very simple for you all. On the first episode, I mentioned how COVID-19 makes it so that patients have a really profound inflammation that leads to acute respiratory distress, distress syndrome. And the intervention that we do for these patients is we intubate them and start them on mechanical ventilation. So on this episode, I'd like to break things down where this talk will, will go. We're going to just focus on mechanical ventilation. We're not going to talk about any other methods of ARDS and what ARDS is. We're going to just make it very focused for today. And f- this hopefully will be tailored to medical students, really anybody who works in the healthcare field. I'll make it very simple for you to understand mechanical ventilation, the basics of mechanical ventilation. And by the end of this video, you're going to be able to understand the different modes of mechanical ventilation. Uh, there's multiple different modes. I'll focus on which ones I think will be more important. But I'll try to make it so that you conceptually understand how mechanical ventilation works rather than understand what each mode is specifically. Because once you understand the concepts regarding what event, how the vent works, it's so easy to extrapolate exactly the different modes and what they do. With that being said, let's first start with the way that I'm going to break down this discussion is talking about the mechanical ventilator breaths, Um, basically what the vent does when a patient is trying to breathe, whether it's control assisted or supported, and then how does the vent make deliver that breath? Is it volume breath or is it pressure support? And so that that's whole. Before we even talk about the modes, I'd like to start about discuss concepts at first. so the way that the way that the airway management really works is a lot of there's many indications for intubating a patient. I won't really go into every detail here, but in general, intubation is a method of being able to help the lung overcome whatever mechanism is under is not allowing the patient to breathe. They could be airway constriction, they could have laryngeal edema, they could be altermental status, a patient's not able to protect their airway. It could be an actual lung pathology affecting patients. It could be endobronchial obstruction that patients will need to be intubated, then place a stent. Or it could just be as a mechanism to help support other issues that patients have, potentially helping them overcome their shock, um, so preserving their lung during that uh, ideology of their initial shock, not necessarily having respiratory issues. So with mechanical ventilator breaths, there's three different types of uh, breaths that the vent controls. They could do controlled breaths, they could do assisted breaths, or they could do supported spontaneous breaths. Um, so those are the different modes of breathing that the vent is able to help patients uh, with breathing. They kind of be able to deliver those type of breaths. Um, but before we even get into that, I want to just make sure that at the end of the day, this information that I'm providing is n- only my opinion. I would want you to make sure you consult with your seniors and your attending physicians before you start implementing any of this medical advice or opinion. It is my opinion is not a strong recommendation at all. I just want to make sure that you're equipping yourself with some basic knowledge so then you could go out and understand a little bit more about your specific patient situation. I don't know what your patients are going through. Every situation is different. So I'd urge you to do not take this information as true until you make your own research. So in terms of mechanical ventilator breaths, like I mentioned, there's three of them, controlled breaths, assisted breaths, and supported breaths. The difference is pretty diff- Pretty The one concept that I want you to recognize is imagine someone who's in a pull, who's hanging from a pull-up um, bar, right? So that's what you can think of mechanical breaths. For a controlled breath, the, the patient himself is not supposed to do any work. It's just like a person who is only hanging from the pull-up bar, but they're so weak, they can't even initiate a pull-up, meaning the patients cannot even initiate a breath. So then you need a friend to help you push, push you up to do a pull-up, right? That's a ventilator helping that patient get that breath in. So they, the ventilator does all the work. That's controlled breath. And that's something that we said uh, the respiratory rate helps us set those 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 breathing those rates of how often you're going to breathe. Um, so, for instance, if a patient is breathing, for instance, we set a respiratory rate of ten breaths per minute. 
then every six seconds a breath will be delivered because you do 60 divided by 10, correct? 10 breaths per minute. That's six seconds per breath, no matter what. So your patient's going to be getting that no matter what. If the patient wants to take a breath at second three, the ventilator will not allow this to happen because it's controlled. And then assisted breath, you could think of assisted breath as the patient is trying to do work. They are, but they're so weak, they can't even, they can't initiate a full pull-up, right? They're starting to, they're hanging for the pull-up bar, but they can't initiate uh, the pull-up bar completely. They might just do 10% of the work, but the friend is still pushing them up, right? So that's the ventilator that takes over what the patient cannot finish. So they're able to at least um, start some type of breath. Um, so that's called assisted because they're essentially just assisting. They're not controlling the whole workout, right? Or the whole breathing circuit or cycle. Supported here is when an analogy again is if your patient is is wants to, is able to do some work um, and at least try to pull herself, him or herself up. But again, they are struggling to finish the whole pull up and there maybe they might fin they might help them support it support them through the last, maybe last couple um, reps or something. So that's supported breathing. So that's here is when patient is triggering a breath, right? They're able to, um, it's almost similar to assisted breath. But once it's triggered, the ventilator will give you some support, but not full support like an assisted breath. Assisted breath gives you the full support. This one supported breaths, you can think of spontaneous breathing trials. Is That's when we put patients on on supported breaths. Um, so it's basically essentially like a supported pull-up, like when you would think uh, um, helping you a little bit, but not doing all the work. So in summary, we talked about the controlled breaths. And typically, this is breaths that are completely controlled by the ventilator. We never, typically from my experience, we don't really set up. Uh, so <clears throat> just to kind of give you a review of the different modes. Um, so we have like assist, assist control that's either volume or pressure controlled. Uh, we have pressure support by itself, or we have synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation with pressure support. And then we have pressure regulated volume control. So just kind of by already knowing controlled breaths, assisted breath, supported breaths, you could already know that a control, you already know exactly, okay, controlled breaths are, the ventilator completely controls it. And assisted breaths, meaning the patient could uh, overbreathe on the vent if they wanted to. And they could start some work because they're able to initiate the breath and ventilator helps take over. So that's assist, right? You're helping them. So when I say assist control, you already know, okay, so that means that the, the ventilator is going to have a set rate, uh, but also the ventilator is going to assist them with additional breaths. So that means that you would know that patients could overbreathe the vent. And then you, if it, and now you know that's AC. And then for pressure or volume control, that's the next discussion we'll have. And then you already know about pressure support already because we just talked about it. It's essentially just completely supported uh, breaths with some pressure. And then in order for you to understand synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation or plus pressure support or pressure regulated volume control, uh, in order to understand those different modes, I think, or just in general to understand how, what is pressure and what is volume, we need to really understand the concepts of those things. So that's kind of the breath delivery. And the way that I like to think about it is think of, of, of the lung as a balloon. And these are the concepts that we'll talk about next is what is plateau pressure? What is peak pressure? What is tidal volume? Um, what is PEEP and all that, right? So just so you understand the settings, uh, these are just basic settings that we said. I won't go over the advanced inspiratory time or any other settings specifically, but the ones you should know as a medical student, as a resident, um, and in general, it's and anyone, anyone really who deals with a vent is, what is a PEEP? What is tidal volume? What is FiO2? Okay. And what is a respiratory rate? So that's sort of the things. Those are the things that are going to drive ventilation, uh, meaning how many times a patient is breathing. And that will affect its CO2 exchange in the alveoli, right? So the breath delivery is the big question. There's volume breaths. And there's pressure breaths that we could, um, based on the mode, could choose as a more of an independent variable. Um, so patients with assist control, volume control, they type their, their type of breath is assisted or controlled, right? So they change between cycles, right? They could be completely controlled if they're 
um, completely paralyzed, they might not initiate an additional breath beyond the respiratory rate that's already set. An independent variable for them for that for that setting is presetting the tidal volume. You ask the machine, I want you to do assist control with volume control, meaning they're going to control the volume. So the ones that's, that's, that could be changing is the pressure, is the peak pressure and plateau pressure based on the patient's compliance as well as its um, resistive forces, how long, how the, the bronchioles are and everything. Um, and so that's something that we'll talk about later. But in total, in general, it controls the tidal volume because it's a lung protective mechanism. And we'll talk about why that's important later on. And it also controls of the minute ventilation because you're controlling the respiratory rate in the tidal volume. Tidal volume times respiratory rate equals minute ventilation, meaning how many times per minute is are you ventilating or how many times per minute is this patient breathing? So you could have a tidal volume. If you understand the, the tidal, tidal volume is a really simple concept to understand. Tidal volume is essentially saying how many, how much volume per breath, per one breath, can I fill the lungs? Is it 500 cc's, 500 milliliters per breath? So if I take a deep breath, depending on my height, um, may an ideal body weight, I'm supposed, if I have a good compliant lung, I'm supposed to have maybe eight cc's per kilogram or of tidal, of a deal tidal, tidal weight. Um, and that is depending on the lung compliance of each each patient. Uh, and, and the lung compliance is basically telling you, okay, maybe I could deliver that specific volume, but if your lungs are not compliant, it's going to require a lot of pressure to feel that much air into your lung because your lungs are very stiff. That's having a very poor lung compliance. And lung compliance, you can think of lung compliance as an equation is how pliable is something. So when you're blowing a balloon, a, a balloon that's just a regular balloon, you will see that it's not that hard to blow, right? You Anyone can blow. You don't need a machine to help blow that balloon. But if I give you a balloon that's made out of steel uh, and it was still the same diameter as any other balloon, any regular balloon, you wouldn't be able to make that <laughs> steel balloon larger, right? It just takes so much pressure to even change the volume. So really the, the compliance is the change in volume over the change in pressure. So if a pressure, if the compliance is low, that would tell me that I could change the change in volume. So from zero or five, whatever, like let's say for instance, lung is completely collapsed, zero tidal volume to 500. And it only took, let's, I'm just picking random numbers. It only took 25 pressure versus 1000 if the lung was, if the balloon was steel or something. So it's just an example, but really that whether the whether how compliant it is has to do with the elasticity or really how, what is the lung pathology. If the lung is scarred uh, and really difficult to extend, then um, it's going to be diff more difficult to um, to provide tidal volume. So that is essentially volume breaths in summary. But before I continue the next talk about pressure breath, you need to understand what is what the different types of pressures in a ventilator. When you see a ventilator you know, curve, you would notice that there's always a peep uh, that's stable. We put that in as a, when you set in the ventilator, you put in the peep, remember? And that is the, the expiratory pressure that's keeping the alveoli open somewhat. Uh, it's typically set at five, or you could go above five uh, millimeters of mercury. And then you're, as you're having inspiratory, as you deliver a breath, you're going to have a curve that's going up. Then it's going to hit a peak. And that is called the peak inspiratory pressure. Or it's otherwise just basically the, the amount of, of pressure it took to fully distend the LV line. So it's the forces, the pressure um, that was needed to overcome resistive and elastic forces of the lung. Um, and then you look and then... When you have a patient at the peak plateau, they're going to come down and eventually hit something called a plateau pressure. Instead of peak inspiratory pressure, it's the plateau pressure where everything is equalized. The pressure is equalized outside 
and inside the alveoli and it's it's still it tells you the static pressure which reflects truly the lung compliance and in order for you to understand if a patient's desatting or having issues at, on the vent you're trying to figure out if this is the compliance that's getting worse or if it's other resistive forces and a good way of seeing it is to try to figure out if the problem is in the peak plateau or if the problem is the plateau pressure and you could tell that you could see the difference if you detail, if you um, essentially look at the difference between the plateau and the peak and the pla and the peak pressure. So peak pressure is always going to be higher, right? Because it's a peak. Peak plateau is going to go down and have the maintenance phase. If you divide or if you uh, take the difference of that, you'll have the resistive airway. Um, if that's greater than five, usually you could say that this is probably um, an airway resistance issue from probably what we could think of as a could be um, ETT occlusion, a kink. You could think of a secretious mucus plugging or bronchospasm. So essentially the problem is an increased peak pressure rather than an, um, in a change in the plateau pressure. But if they're both elevated, the peak plateau is elevated um, as well as uh, the, the plateau pressure, then at that point you could assume that it could potentially be a compliance issue. Okay, so now that we're done with that volume breaths, um, I want to talk about pressure breaths. And again, the whole concept is that if you're having a mechanical ventilation mode that is purely pressure controlled, we have to keep in mind the compliance, right? So typically, if you have, you either have a volume control or pressure control, meaning that you're going to be able to, that's going to be a variable that you could um, mono set. So you're either setting the volume, the tidal volume, or you're setting a pressure uh, control. You're telling, okay, this is what the pressure that I want you to deliver at each breath, but you won't be able to control the volume. So you can't control both the pressure and the volume at the same time. So the issue with that is that if you have someone with a pressure breath, you won't be able to control the tidal volume. You might have to check the tidal volume all the time to make sure that's the adequate tidal volume you want. And if it's not, you might have to change the pressure that you're setting um, for those pressure breaths. And because it has to do with compliance again. And but typically for pressure breaths, the way it is is you obviously there's a preset pressure that will be delivered to the patient once the ventilator is triggered. So whether when the patient's either breathing, either assisted or controlled breathing. Uh, and in pressure mode, the the pre the preset pressure is reached very instantly. It kind of happens very fast, kind of like when you're blowing the, the balloon, uh, it happens really quickly and remains at that pressure for a set time. And that's called the inspiratory time. And then it cycles to exhalation. Once that time is reached, we won't go into the um, inspiratory time, expiratory time on this topic, but that's something that you should know. So with that being said, I think that we now have a really good understanding of basic mechan mechanical ventilation concepts. Now let's put it together in the modes. Uh, now that you know those concepts, the breathing types, um, the, the how you to deliver a breath, whether it's volume or pressure. So in summary, breathing types, there's controlled, there's assisted, there's supported. Controlled mechanical ventilator does all the work. Assisted, it does does some of the work, and then supported breath um, ventilator assists to finish the work. So less less amount of work. So basically, you could think of support as mechanical ventilator support as controlled is all the support. Assisted some, and supported is very little. Uh, and then the other thing would be um, at that point, how you deliver the breath. Are you delivering the breath through a volume? Or through a pressure and we went over that already but now let's put it together all these concepts and put it into one really full understanding how you could apply it clinically so there's five different modes uh the first one that we'll talk about is pressure um there's volume volume assist control there's pressure assist control so the, in the name alone you could already tell what it's going to do it's going to give you an assist control um way of breathing type meaning that there are going to be moments where you could set the respiratory rate. You can set the respiratory rate and the tidal volume because it's volume control. So, but it also gives you the ability to assist. So if the patient wants to breathe over the vent, they could do that. So they could trigger beyond the rate that you set it. So now assist control, same idea, same type of the breathing type. The only difference is the, the breaths that are delivered is in pressure. It won't, you're going to set a specific respiratory rate and pressure. Obviously, also PEEP and FIO2, that's the same. The only difference between those two is the pressure that you're setting. But the difference between pressure assist control now is you won't be able to control the tidal volume. The only way to control it, you won't be able to set it. The only way to control it is by changing the pressure.
Pressure support is typically a mode that we used uh, for a lot of times just for patients who are being like a spontaneous breathing trials. There's no respiratory rate that is set and, a min and there's usually a minimal amount of um, pressure support. You usually give five centimeters of water um, is set. Uh, and you basically want to see if the patient's comfortable or not. And you do give an adequate uh, tidal volume um, before you extubate it, making sure that if they're, if they're comfortable, we look at other parameters, they could be extubated successfully after a specific amount of time on that specific mode. So we use that a lot, that's pressure support. The ones that I use a lot is assist control, volume control, and pressure assist control I haven't used much at all. And the other one that's kind of difficult um, because it combines almost everything is the synchronized mandatory ventilation or volume SIMV plus positive um, support or pressure support. So the big thing is you have to understand is kind of all these concepts that we talked about, um, all the three different types of breath. And if you understand all that and have a very good understanding of it, this mode could be very simple to understand. All it's doing is, you, again, you're going to set a respiratory rate. You're going to set a tidal volume as well as FiO2 and PEEP. You're setting a tidal volume because we have its volume. Remember, it's volume SIMV. There's also pressure SIMV. And in those cases, you set the pressure, not the tidal volume. So again, you're going to have a, a mode where you're essentially, you don't, if patients do not have adequate respiratory drive or volume assisted breath, you uh, they're not able to trigger, you're going to have a controlled breathing mode for that. So if you have a respiratory rate that's set, you're going to have, you're going to give that. Uh, and it could be controlled, but if the patient makes no effort, or it could be assisted if the patient is triggering the ventilator at or near the, um, the five, fifth second, right, or whatever moment they want it. And the ventilator will sync. The only difference between assist control, um, volume control is really, so you're probably thinking, this sounds exactly like volume control, assist control, volume control. It is. The only difference is that the ventilator will synchronize with the patient's effort and give an assisted breath if the patient initiates their breath um, during the fifth second versus the assist control, volume control. They don't work. Uh, the complex, it's pretty complex to explain it, but essentially they don't synchronize with the same. Um, there's some dyssynchrony involved with when the patient's initiating and when the ventilator is giving the breath. Um, so that's something that you normally see it in a pediatric and pediatric ICU. Um, and that's a very good mode to have those patients on because you're essentially controlling in um, the volume or the pressure pretty drastically and still make it synchronized. Uh, and then pressure regulate, like again, so there's volume SIMV and there's pressure SIMV. Um, and then pressure regulated volume control. Um, this is actually a pretty good mode for a lot of patients um, who are um, typically in acute respiratory distress syndrome because you're able to, it's regulated volume control. So you're able to control the um, alveolar lung injury uh, with patients with, with volumetric trauma from a large volume, tidal volume. The way that it works is uh, it's considered a pressure mode because it's pressure regulated. Um, as the breaths are given as pressure breaths. So the, gave, the, pressure, the breaths are pressure controlled um, with, um, with a decelerating inspiratory flow. So the way that it works physiologically, when you have patients who are breathing, they breathe really fast right away, but then their, the, their inspiratory flow decelerates over time. Uh, during that, so that's kind of what pressure regulated is, is they give a, a pretty strong pressure right away, and then eventually it starts going down. And the, the goal is to target a tidal volume. That's why it's volume control. So you have you have a pressure that's set, and you're targeting a tidal volume so that you can ensure adequate tidal volumes as lung compliance. So then the so to contrast it, this is different from patients with assist control, pressure control, right? Because for assist control, pressure control, um, we were we were setting the pressure, but we were not able to ensure adequate tidal volumes um, as a lung compliance change. So this is even a more advanced future of pressure control, volume control. Um, so I would definitely put these patients on that control. If I was trying to make sure that I have a patient with severe acute respiratory distress, and I want to make sure that the tidal volume is appropriate, uh, well controlled. It's a low a low number. Uh, and that also the plateau pressure doesn't go up or anything because it, it tells you so there's the pressure alarms that go off if if let's say you set it at specific pressure let's say I want to give uh, a peak of pressure of this and the pressure alarms if it sets above 30 or that's if you set it at 30 and it goes above 30 then it's going to set an alarm to avoid those high pressures 
um, pressures at the alveoli. And if you have a really high pressure at the alveoli, you're going to cause barrel trauma. Um, and usually this alarm goes like five, usually five centimeters less than the alarm that, number that you set. And once the high pressure is reached or it goes over, it's actually the inspiration stops. No more tidal volume is given and the breath cycles goes to exhalation. So the, the, the inspiratory, inspiratory phase is controlled by the pressure. And once it reaches that specific pressure, so it's filling it up, filling it up until it reaches that pressure, it reaches it, and now it goes to exhalation. Once it reaches the set pressure that you set, that you put in. Um, and then it, it also gives you an adequate tidal volume, hopefully. So that's kind of all the different modes that we wanted to talk about today. And it's really important for us to, if, if you didn't get all of this, it's okay. Just watch the video a couple of times. It is very difficult concepts. But, and I hope I made it uh, a little bit more clear for you guys. Uh, and just so you know, it does take a lot of time to understand this. It took me a long time to understand the concepts myself. Um, so I hope that you, once you have this information down, you can pass it on to others. And with that being said, this is the last uh, couple seconds of the episode, number two of the Medical Chalk Talks podcast by me, Evid Arias. And I want to thank you again for listening and hopefully you come back for episode number three where I'll be talking a little bit more in depth about acute respiratory distress syndrome. And it was important for us to talk about mechanical ventilation because that is the gold standard for management of patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. But if you have any other questions, please follow me at Evid Arias on Instagram, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you or get any feedback from you. Have a great day. Take care.